So let's get Stu on the line and I'll get started with this guy because uh, PT, 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 that is Buds and that is Stu. Oh, he's a badass. Class is fine. We're kicking, getting ready to get started. If I dial the wrong number again, I'll kill myself. I have a habit of doing that. Hey, hey, Stu here. Hey, I was wondering if I dialed the wrong number, big guy. <laughs> no, just, had to, just uh, had to do something real quick. We get in a quiet room so we can get this thing done. Yeah, let's get it done, man. Let's get it done. A uh, good bunch of guys on here. Everybody's pumped up to, you know, hear from Stu. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's so important to buds the uh, the tips, the the training to to get through that. And you are certainly the uh, PT dude. You've done that. Done the academy. Uh, done the SDVs, and uh, so these guys are just all open ears, man. They got to hear from the big guy. All right. Well, I can. Uh, where do you want me to start? Well, let me ask you this, bro. Did uh, uh, where'd you grow up at? You know, I grew up in a little town, northern Florida, called Live Oak, Florida. It's uh, Swanee County. You've probably heard of the Swanee River. Yeah. Um, there's nothing else around it. It's a very rural country uh, country place to grow up. A lot of fun. Played uh, played about every sport there was in high school: wrestling, football, baseball track power lifter you know so uh I, I came from really my true loves were power lifting and football so i was one of those kind of jocks uh growing up and uh, i soon realized that though i thought i was in good football shape when i went to the naval academy i realized i wasn't in military shape well yeah i hear <laughs> that that was your uh, dad or any brothers you have a military family you know, my dad was drafted, uh, Vietnam, um, had flat feet though, and broke both his ankles and got sent home. I was about, I was about four months old, so he was, uh, he was pretty happy about that. <laughs> flat feet, I think. But, um, no, but my, um, my, both my grandfathers were, uh, World War II. Uh, one was 30 years in the Army, uh, went World War II and Korean War. Uh, in fact, he was in Japan about two months after the bomb had blasted. So he went there and saw all that shit, the stuff, excuse me. And then uh, my other grandfather uh, came in on Normandy and went all the way to Berlin. So, with uh, General Patton's army. Yeah, do me a favor, try not to fucking swear on here, all right, bro? <laughs> okay, I'll try. The uh, yeah, I had a uh, a grandfather in uh, World War Two in the army, and my grand uh, the other grandfather was in World War One. Had two ships sunk out from underneath him. Wow. So, uh, yeah, we uh, we have it going on, man. So uh, how'd you do in high school, Stu? What kind of grades did you get? Yeah, all right. You know, I wasn't a, a super brain. Uh, like I said, I I played a sport every semester I was in high school. Um, Cause really, to be honest, there was nothing else to do. You yeah. know, it was basically play sports but you know, I had uh, I typically had you know anywhere from a 3.5 to a 3.7 grade average so it was like you know A's and B's but sometimes it was 50-50 A's B's sometimes I'd do a little better and have uh, one or two more A's and B's but I did okay I mean um, like I said it wasn't uh, wasn't like valedictorian times but it was uh, it was good enough to get into the academy so that was good well, how'd all that work out? Did uh, how did how did you find out about the academy uh, to want to do that? That's a good question. Uh, you know, that back then it was in the '80s. Kind of dating myself here, but um, you know, movies like Top Gun were out, and you know, so that was pretty cool to be a fighter pilot. And I remember being in the outfield in high school, and just you know, we'd sit there and talk all the lines of uh, you know Top Gun just for fun, and um, you know, being being dork high school kids, but uh, you know, um, you know, when I first went to the academy, I didn't know anything about Navy SEALs. I was thinking I'd want to be a pilot, maybe a Marine. 
Um, and then there were some Navy SEALs at the academy that would run these guys through these workouts. And I remember going to my first one and just got my butt handed to me. And I said, I got to get better at this. So I busted my butt for about three years and, uh, you know, wound up leaving, you know, with a Navy SEAL bill out of the academy. So, so you never really uh, went to the academy to be a SEAL? I did not. I, did, I didn't know anything about it. One a uh, couple of PT sessions uh, had you hooked. Yeah, pretty much. And the guys were great. I mean, the, these are seals that just walked on water, you know, at the academy, and you know, you just like you were just scared to death of them, but you wanted to be them, and you know, you just did everything you can to learn from them, and you know, it was just just a great uh, great role model. And then you know, as a freshman and sophomore at the academy, you looked up to the guys that were juniors and seniors that went before you and you know those guys all did well and you know went to buds and did well at buds and in their platoons and mm -hmm. you know we'd spend our spring breaks going to seal teams just to kind of you know hang out with uh you know lieutenant or you know one of the officers and um you know try to learn a little bit more about the training and you know it was uh we were always trying to learn about seal training once i got into it but you got to remember in the 80s there was nothing about seals out there yeah. i mean there were just no road warrior books there was no dick couch books there were no navy seal workouts you know it was no internet no no internet yeah we didn't have anything you know i if i wanted to write my wife overseas i wrote a letter man sent that shit you know that's right same here the uh what'd you do in the uh because you know guys haven't really heard that before one of my favorite guys uh in seal team was a uh you know he was a midshipman that showed up for a couple of weeks and i drugged that badass kid all over the place blowing shit up uh he just became kind of a demo bitch but a uh, really hard guy and you know he's a seal officer now but uh did you do that you uh you said you attached to the teams for a couple of weeks yeah, we had, uh, we, of course, back then we had a mini buds program that was going on, like a three week course that you could do during the summer. But then we would get, uh, you know, no cost TAD orders. So we had to pay for our travel out there, drive out there, or whatever, you know, hang out, you know, find a place to stay. Um, a lot of times we just, you know, stayed with some ensign or JG that was, uh, you know, new, new with the team. I was lucky I had family in Virginia Beach, so that worked out real well. So I hung out over there and bounced around. I remember we were stationed with groups, so we just kind of bounced around from each one of the teams. So it was great. You know, we didn't do, like I said, we didn't do a whole lot of stuff. They were a little bit hesitant of getting us involved. Like I know some of the mids that I sent when I went back as an instructor to the academy, they were they were doing, like you were saying, doing demo runs and shooting and, yeah. you know, crazy stuff. Yeah, so, we had a good time with them. A real oh, good yeah. time with it. Yeah. And that was in the Navy wide. Those guys would go on carriers and all that stuff. You know, when I was in the fleet, the uh, midshipmen would come to the uh, ship and all that other uh, stuff we did. Yeah. Well, you know, that part of the academy is just trying to figure out what you want to do. And like I said, I, you know, I went spent time at, at, you know, a month at Quantico and was played the Marine stuff. And I realized that really wasn't for me. You know, um, you know, been on a ship, been on a submarine. You know, flying helicopters and flew in the little trainer jets and uh, realized it was fun. That was probably a good second. But, uh, you know, after, you know, hanging out with those SEALs at the academy and then spending some leave time with them, I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Well, I was talking to Alden the other night. He said the only reason you got through the academy is you copied off his papers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> when did you meet him there? Yeah, you know, Alden and I, that's a funny story, because Alden and I actually met on restriction freshman year. Um, Go figure. A couple yeah, of uh, yeah. prospective SEALs meeting on restriction. <laughs> yeah, restriction basically at the Naval Academy, if it means that you just did something stupid and you got caught. And um, so we uh, typically, you know, when you're 18, 19 years old, um, you know, and you're, you get about 12 hours of liberty a week. Um, you just, you, you know, what we were doing, we were tying one on, and, you know, I guess uh, you weren't, weren't supposed to do that, obviously. And, um, uh, yeah, got busted for it. Learned, our, learned the evil of our ways, and, um, you know, luckily we got to shovel some snow, and we actually got, uh, got some days removed for every hour of 
snow shoveling we did, we got a day of restriction on. So you get 30 days restriction. Now, this is what sucked about 30 days restriction, is that you only get, you only do the restriction on your Liberty Days, which is Saturday and Sunday. 30, 30 days meant 15 weeks of Saturdays and Sundays. And I remember. Got 30 days of Liberty Days taken out. So we were shoveling our butts off trying to get this. Every hour we were shoveling was a day. Every two hours was a weekend. I think we shoveled about, I don't know, 12 hours one Saturday afternoon just to, you know. I remember guys getting busted in the fleet on deployments for some shit. It wasn't SEALs, you know, just the regular dudes on the ships. And uh, they'd get 30 days uh, restriction, 30 extra duty. But uh, when we were underway out at sea, it stopped. So, I mean, they'd go through an entire deployment and never see a port. You know, oh, it was bad. Yeah. Hell, hell, hell. So, uh, now you and Alden, uh, now the Academy, I've been to the uh, Naval Academy, very cool place, but I'll tell you a place I bet you haven't been that I've been. Uh, I trained uh, with the Japanese divers at the uh, Japanese Naval Academy. That I have not done. I'll tell you, man, that was one fantastic experience. What a historic, historic old uh old place boy those dudes were rigid and i know that uh, our naval academy has that but i'm telling you what man that was uh, spooky rigid there but uh, we spent a week there working with the divers uh, doing some sub shit and uh, very uh, very very cool very very cool <laughs> uh, yeah those, those guys, we had some foreign exchange students that were japanese and uh koreans and uh yeah they were wound tight yeah oh yeah oh yeah they are Good. So uh, you and Alden uh, started becoming PT buddies and all that stuff. Started hanging out, thinking about uh, yeah. the buds. Yeah, I, t I take it your crowd knows Alden. He's the uh, you know the perfect push-up guy. Yeah. For, you know, former SEAL. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, we became buddies then, and um, uh, then we both got SEAL billets out of the academy, and uh, we were we were in the same class, graduated the same class, and then. Um, Let's see. Then we went to the same SEAL team, SDV Team Two, which I guess I've heard recently no longer exists. Mm -hmm. um, they moved it all out to the West Coast. Oh, um, I don't mind. And then, um, yeah, we were in each other's weddings, and oh, we just we've been buddies ever since. So it's been since we were eighteen, nineteen years old, we've been buddies. So over twenty years now. Now, Alden also said the only uh, reason you got through buds is he carried you uh, through the uh, whole thing. <laughs> Now, let me go. Uh, so you guys uh, are training together, and you formed up in the uh, same class? Or uh, yeah, Alden said I, something about way, getting rolled. The way it started, I started out a little bit before him. I started 180, and I went all the way to like six weeks before graduation. I blew out my knee, and uh, it was bad enough to where they um, rolled me for two classes. So, mm -hmm. And I ca caught up with his class. And... Um, and we wound up finishing together, third phase together. So, well, let's go. Uh, that's how the whole thing worked. Ouch. Uh, let's go back to uh, first phase. Now, you're, uh, you know, a rock star dude now, and we want to get all into that. But when you started first phase, you know, not knowing, I mean, you're just like everyone else. I mean, you don't know. Uh, what were your uh, strong points when you went into Buds? Were you really happy? with the way you uh, had trained getting in there? Yeah, I really was. So I, like I said, I started out a football playing power lifter. So I figured I had enough of that fast twitch strength power um, that I needed. You know, I didn't need to, to do any more lifting weights. So I actually didn't touch another weight for about a year and a half. And all I did was run and swim and PT and I busted, busted ass on all of those and got really good scores um, before I, I went out to Bud's. And uh, i be honest with you, I felt like I got out of shape my first four weeks at Bud's. I really felt I was, I mean, I was really nailing the runs. I was hitting the swims. I mean, I wasn't super fast on runs. I'd say if I had a nemesis, it was running because I was a 200-pound guy. You know, kind of like I said, long distance for me was a mile and a half, you know, before I started in the military. Um, so, you know, 
I was running probably around 27, 28 minute four mile runs over at Bud's. Um, probably about nine minute, mile and a half stuff. So it wasn't slow. Doesn't sound bad to me. There were a lot of guys faster than me. Now, uh, Anything else? I was, I was kicked butt on the swims and the PT went really, really well. What were your, uh, do you remember much about your PT scores when you went in the uh, test yeah. that you took? Yeah, I remember. Um, I hit um, just under seven minutes on the swim. Um, uh, let me see, 120 push-ups, like 110 sit-ups, 25 pull-ups, and like an 850 run. So, it's pretty good. Yeah, pretty there, damn there, good. There, there were guys faster than me on the run, but uh, like I said, from the academy, you really had to stand out somewhere, and uh, PT was one way to do it. Um, and, uh, I mean, there, there were guys that blew away those scores. I mean, we, we had a guy that did a sub-six. 500 yard swim, like a 540. I mean, it's ridiculous. That's super fast. Um, another guy did like a 730 mile and a half run, you know, 35 pull ups. We actually had one guy do over 70 pull ups yeah. for his test. Yeah. And, no, and that's no kipping. There's none of this new kipping stuff they're doing nowadays. I mean, that's like no kipping. No, they don't. They still don't put up with it. That's just some yeah. workouts that they. Right. Are doing man, they're uh, they're ruthless about that, and then very cool too because uh, those are some really good times uh, for being a sea cow. You were uh, packing over two hundred pounds. Uh, Alden was, I was when we went in, and for some reason, you know, uh, what the guy. I'm reading some of the comments on here, and the guys are a little confused about the uh, first four weeks of buds. Uh, you were just in really, really uh, kick-ass shape when you went in there. You were ready to go. I was. I was super ready to go, and I tell people all this. I say, you need to go to Bud's with the mindset of competing, not just surviving. Because I've seen many people go to Bud's, and they just are trying to survive with the minimum standard. You know, just do what you can to get through, and it is painful. That is a painful way to go through Bud's. If you go through Bud's and you're ready to win the run, win the race, do the most push-ups, do the most pull-ups, I'm telling you, every day is a competition. And it is fun. And I used to look forward to Mondays because, you know, I was going to kick somebody's ass in that run. You know, that's the way I had to look at it. I looked like I was, like, competing to win. And the way I compare it is, like, the first time I ran a marathon, and I only ran one. I never ran another one because it sucked. Um, but I, I was in survival mode, right? And I did it in, like, three and a half hours. Um, not a horrible score, but not great either. Um, and, uh, the, you know, I remember starting this thing off. I look over to me and I see this Kenyan, you know, warming up, stretching. You know, he is getting ready to run. And, like, who was in competition mode and who was in survival mode in that situation? I mean, there's a good chance that I wasn't finished that, uh, that marathon just because I was in survival mode. You know, I was just trying to finish it. You know, that guy was trying to drop a minute off his best time. So he was in competition. He was, there was no question in his mind he wasn't going to finish a marathon, right? And that's the kind of mentality you have to go when you go to Bud's. you got to live to compete, not just survive. Well, you see that out there, and, uh, you know, it makes sense to me now when you say it, because I know that's, uh, you know, you are. You're a huge competitor still today. And, uh, you know, I guess all SEALs are after they get out. You know, you kind of take it to a new level, but... Uh, you're right, you know, when we'd be out uh, lined up for the O course at Bud's, you know, uh, there were just some of us that were just, you know, pounding our fists, let's go, let's go, my turn, my turn, let me go, let me go, like a racehorse trying to, you know, get out of that corral, you know, and there were other dudes going, oh shit, somebody else go, you know, they'd been up all night, they'd been sweating this, you know, they know, and they're in survival mode, you know, and yep. Very cool. Absolutely. Sweating every event. Oh. Bugs, you know. And let's go. Let's better our time. And uh, because you know, if you didn't, and you were up in that percentage of the uh, class, if you didn't better your last time, you were going to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, you know? absolutely. What the hell was your problem today, you know, putting it mildly? Uh, yeah. You know, you were even beaten for a, uh, you know, a performance that was better than most but not better than your last time you know and they'd light into your shit so. oh yeah absolutely well the, the one kid asked about the four weeks well 
Um, when, when I went through, Hell Week was the fifth week. Mm-hmm. So um, I think they've changed it now. I think it might be the third or second week now. Hell, hell I don't know. But uh, it was the fifth week. So uh, the first four weeks were just a series of, you know, all the tests that you had to take, ground proofing, life saving, underwater swims, and, you know, IBS, surf torture, you know, all that stuff. Um, and, uh, but I really felt like, you know, I was really prepared in that first four weeks. They weren't that hard. I mean, it was hard. I mean, there were days, there were moments that were tough that you hit muscle failure. But at the end of the day, I was like, okay, not too bad. You know, go home, lick my wounds, and come back for another day. And, uh, but that week five, man, that hell week, there's not much you can do to prepare for that. I mean, that, that is a true kick in the nuts. And it doesn't help you at all to practice getting kicked in the nuts to make getting kicked in the nuts easier. Right. You know, it's just one of those things that is just a gut check for the week. Now, we're, uh, let's unconfuse a few dudes here right now. When you right. say that your first four weeks of buds, this is where it's confusing, guys, because I would say the same thing. Uh, because I was in the upper 10% of my buds class, as big and goofy as I was, man, I, you know, I did everything really well uh, physically. I didn't have any problems. And then it got down to the uh, the lower percentages. So uh, where were you in your buds class, man? You had to be right up there, uh, oh, one was, of the better swimmers, better runners, better PT. Yeah, I, I would say I was in the top 10% on, swim, on running. Like I said, that was my weakness. But everything else was like either number one or number two. Um, maybe out of the swim pairs, I was usually swim pair two or, or three. Yeah. You know, somewhere around there. You know, second or third mm-hmm. out of the swim pairs. But uh, I was actually uh, second in the class on the obstacle course. Um, and it, it battled every week. It was this enlisted guy and me. Go back and forth. Go back and forth. Either I beat him or he beat me. And it was turn into this officers versus enlisted thing at the towards the last part of third phase which was kind of fun but um um yeah, he actually wound up beating me at the end so he actually had the fastest time by about two seconds yeah you know when you uh you know and that's the uh str- it, it's really good you're bringing this up because when you're doing push-ups out at buds you know that constant grind uh, make no mistake for these guys listening you know how terribly terribly hard that four weeks was but when you're not hurting as bad as that guy who's in the lower half of the class, you know, that's, you know, where the rubber meets the road. You are so happy of how hard you worked before you went there versus some dude that is just, you know, and, and that's it. That lower half of the class has taken a terrible ass kicking. Just to where you now, all these years later, say, you know, the first four weeks, you know, wasn't that bad for me. Uh, the other guys in your class uh, that were lower than you in that lower 50%, if they even made it, were like, oh, that was the worst four weeks of my freaking life. Absolutely. I remember I remember seeing people quit and just say, you know, we'd be sitting in a classroom, just got through doing a, you know, mile ocean swim or something, and this guy, you know, walks out, goes and quits. I'm like, what the hell just happened? Why'd he quit? Yeah. yeah, I'm ready to eat breakfast and get ready for the next event. You know, um, you know, it was like it never entered my mind to quit. I just prayed that I would not get injured. That was the only thing that I could see that would keep me from graduating. Buds was getting injured. Yeah. So how'd the uh, rest of your first phase go? Uh, you know, when we're, uh, you know, your hell week, the uh, drown proofing, did you have any trouble with the water work? Did you wish you'd have worked on anything more uh, before you went, or were you just pretty damn pleased with yourself? No, um, you know, when I went there, you know, we didn't really, like I said, there wasn't a whole lot of information about what Buds was, you know, when we went. Um, you know, we had heard, oh, yeah, you got to tie your hands behind your back, and feet together and you got an underwater swim for 50 meters and so um, we kind of practiced that some but to be honest they teach you that there at Bud's and then you have you know you can practice it on your own on Saturday mornings at the you know the the combat training tank if you want and I remember what we would do we'd just take our boat crew over and uh, just practice drown proofing on Saturday mornings for about an hour and you know along with 
you know, having a couple practices during the week with the uh, with your class, that was really enough. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, I said, you know, don't tie your ass up and jump in a pool, you know, and try to teach yourself how to drown proof. You know, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't find it to be that horrible. Um, however, if you feel like you need to practice it, practice it with rubber bands, maybe, so you can, you know, so you're not stuck at the bottom, yeah. you know. Well, you know, what guys need to realize, because, you know, again, you and I, I believe, were very fortunate in the fact that we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have a lot of the websites and this tremendous amount of information out there, and a lot of it bad. Uh, and we went in with clear heads. And, you know, Bud's is a school. It's important for these. And for some reason, a lot of guys think that they just throw you in the pool with your hands and feet tired of this pool. They teach you. Yes. You know, they teach you how to do the evolution, and if if guys would just clear their head and pay attention to the information coming out of that instructor's mouth, you know, and they, you know, you get it done. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're going to show you how to do everything, and when they do, when you do do it for your first time, guess what? There's the medical guys there. There's guys that can help you get out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's safer. You know, so I, I tell folks all the time, I said, you know, just get in good shape. Yeah. You know, don't worry about, you know, the knot tying and the underwater swimming and, and all that. I mean, it's good to learn the techniques of it, but don't waste, you know, two hours of your day practicing it because you really don't need to. You don't. And physical shape, you know, show up ready to compete. And, uh, yeah, freaking A, man. Uh, good stuff, Stu, good stuff. So how was your... Uh, you obviously didn't have any trouble with the uh, first phase. How was your second phase, dude? Now we're in the diving. Yeah, well, we went through Hell Week about Halloween. So I remember I remember it being Halloween time right as Hell Week was over. So it was right at that phase where it was cold but not crazy cold yet. But the uh, dive phase got cold as hell. I mean, it was – I've never been more cold in my life than second phase. Oh, hang on a second, got a phone in the background. Sorry. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, so we were in dive phase December, January, doing two dives a day and night dives, and i tell you what, I've never been more cold in my life. Yeah, you went through the same uh, class I basically did, a September class. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, you know, guys are all on about the winter class, the winter hell, you know, the hell week, uh, winter time, but a true winter class is a September class because we – had basically six months of uh, you know the uh, guys that actually go through a winter class uh, in December uh, hell week are getting sunburns in third phase we never had that we were cold 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 <laughs> yeah, it was cold all the damn time yeah it was really cold a winter class starts in September fellas and uh, it's a cold first phase a really horrible cold second phase and then third phase sucks too but you know, you're having so much fun you know on the land you know cool. yeah it's a little bit better at the yeah, third phase at the island so uh but yeah, second phase was, was nice. I, you know, I really enjoyed the scuba. I've been scuba diving since I was 12 years old, and uh, you know, um, I, I fell in love with it. And to this day, uh, you know, I still I still enjoy it. However, I do have new criteria for my scuba diving. It requires three things. It requires daylight. It requires water where I don't need a wetsuit, and it requires 100 foot visibility. Well, what about uh, groceries? <laughs> What's that? What about groceries? My groceries? The only way I'm diving, uh, you know, I, I got about the same criteria, but there's got to be lobsters, there's got to be abs oh. underneath me. You know, I'm if I'm going uh, yeah. down there, there's got to be something to eat that I'm going after. Oh, yeah. Spear fishing, different story. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a whole different, whole different game there. Good point. So, uh, no problems in second phase. No, I enjoyed second phase. Good. Pretty now, uh, uh, Alden talked about it. How big is your class at this point? Oh, good point. Um, well, no, you, I'm sorry. You and Alden weren't in this. Uh... We didn't go through second phase together. Yeah, we. I, I met him up in third phase. And um, uh, here's, uh, we started out with 120. And, um, and uh, I remember we lost about a person a day for four weeks. So we lost, on average, about, I, th 
think we lost about a first day. So we lost 30 people before Hell Week. So we went into Hell Week with like 90 people. And then after Hell Week, we had dropped another 45. So we lost 45 people during Hell Week. So we had about 45 people going into second phase. Um, that, that was, that's a much easier to manage class. Yeah, and right. uh, like I said, I stayed in that class until uh, like third week of third phase uh, when I injured my knee, and um, uh, they they, had, they hadn't dropped many more since then. Usually, people don't quit second phase, or, or if they do, it's it's injured. Usually, they roll back um, early. They failed, unless they failed something. Yeah, you know, usually if you if you do real well and you haven't failed anything, they'll they'll keep you there. You know. They'll keep you there and get you graduated. Yeah. You know? So. Well, we go into uh, third phase. So uh, overall, you know, guys are uh, very curious now. They know who you are. They're curious about this knee injury. But overall, outside of that, how was your uh, third phase experience? Because it's very cool at this point, and I was talking to Alden about it. Uh, now, you're a SEAL officer. And yeah. this is where the camouflage paint comes out. This is why guys, you know, become seals and uh, we're out in the island and we're all treated like big dudes we start you know uh, planning ops and we're live fire shooting blowing stuff up but uh, uh, how was it being your you know that oh, man, was your that, first that was, seal officer experience for me I tell you what like I said I took I took eight weeks and recovered you know with that knee injury but with that recovery I got stronger um, I was faster and, uh, you know, as my knee got worse and worse, second phase, and at the first part of third phase, um, you know, my run times were getting slower and slower. You know, they dropped down to like 29. I think that was like the minimum standard was like 29 on a four mile time to run. But after that little recovery break I had, I was down to 26. You know, so I dropped three minutes off my four mile time to run with that little, you know, recovery stint in uh, what they used to call rollback land. Um, but I took advantage of rollback land. I busted my ass and got stronger, got faster. Um, so when I showed up to uh, third phase, I actually, Alden was the class leader, but, you know, being rules, being what they are, I was I outranked Alden. So I was, uh, and, and how they outrank you at the academy is just by order of merit, which is just your, your grade point average, basically. So... I was smarter than Alden, so you can you can tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll pass it on. <laughs> so I took over his class, third phase, and so I got to be class leader for a for a um, for a, a, a phase, which I, it was a lot of fun. It was a good leadership experience. Um, we actually did really well, and you know Alden was you know basically the you know assistant class leader which you know there were only two officers so it made it real easy um, and um, yeah, we had a blast running that class what Better did uh, what did happen to your knee what did you do you know I had both IT band you know iliotibial band uh, flare up and patellofemoral syndrome so it was both sides of the tendons you know your, your knee got an inside and an outside tendons that run across it both of them were just so swollen that I I couldn't even bend my knee to to top my clutch in my car. So and I had one of those standard, you know, stick shift trucks and uh, could not could not even bend it to uh, to pop my clutch. So I actually had a brace on my knee for about four weeks and then I rehabbed it for another four weeks and. Um, yeah, that sucked, man. That, that was a bad injury. That I've, I've never had anything like that. Well, that doesn't sound like something you uh, step in a hole and twist your leg. It sounds like something that was building up. Yeah, it might have been, you know, but I remember when it happened. We were running those damn burns, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it was just up and down running of the burns, up and down running. And then we put, you know, guys on our back. And it was, you know, you're carrying these guys up these berms, and it just at that at that point, it, it just it, something happened to it, and it wasn't a break, it wasn't a tear or anything like that. It was just, I saw that MRI on it, and it was just bright red. You know, every tendon around my the ligaments were fine. Every tendon around my knee was just bright red and about double the size. It was it was nasty. 
You're you're uh, you're kicking ass tonight, and it's important for these guys to know too because uh, a big part of my injuries uh, was that damn buddy carry. Now yeah. you, you're a big guy in buds, uh, and you're not going to pick up a little guy yeah. to buddy carry. Yeah. You've yeah. get the the biggest guy, and uh, that was you know Wednesday PT was the O course the, the team too, and we'd run the O course uh, three times. We'd do a loop. Uh, you know, a couple of miles around the, uh, you know, the amphib base, go back, run it three times, and we'd wind up down to the beach and be running those stairs. And when they say buddy carry, you know, everybody looks around. The only dude, you know, my size was Gorslin, and that dude weighed 40, you know, oh, man. So, uh, yeah, it uh, it sucks to be us at times. Uh, yeah, my, my guy was about 220, and I was about, you know, 200, 205. You know, it wasn't horribly overweight, but, you know, you know, over my weight, but at the same time, you know, it's 200 damn pounds you're putting on your back and you're running these berms, and I don't know, something, something happened, it was a weakness in my knee that uh, just gave out, you know, I haven't had any problems since, you know, and, um, you know, it was just a bad flare-up of tendonitis, and you're, you're probably right, it was something that just built up, built up, built up over second phase, because uh, I could see my run, run times getting slower, you know, didn't necessarily hurt, you know, I kept kept uh you know steady dose of ice on it every day and you know kind of took care of it but you know eventually you know it was just one bad afternoon that uh, really put it over the edge that i couldn't do anything with it yeah and being a bigger guy in the teams you know all those jumps and uh you know just oh boy you know we uh a sea cow you know we uh dudes over 200 pounds we tend to take a beating yeah. uh, I tell you what, old Millsy, Alden, I got to can him credit. He was 230 pounds, and he could still do 30 pull-ups. Yeah, yeah, he was a big guy. Yeah. Uh, big guy. Big guy, yeah. So uh, you graduate, and you and Millsy uh, shoot off the SDV team, uh, too. Yeah, we come back to the East Coast and um, just have a blast. We are two ensigns running around the team with with just crazy we're just looking for anything to do we were signing up we we're going and bugging the training officer you know with anything that was open you know hey can we go to this school hey can we go to this school hey i see fork drive forklift driving schools available can we go do that i mean we were just just having a blast you know that's probably the best time in the navy that i had because you know when you're an ensign you really aren't in charge of anything except for yourself and uh you just have you know, you just had a good time, and our job, and we knew that we had a lot to learn, and, you know, we had that attitude of, like, you know, everybody there that was there before us obviously is smarter than we are about SEAL teams, so we, you know, we were just in receive mode all the time, and uh, I, I think it made us, I think it made us better officers. Now, did you and him check in at the same time on the same day? Same day. Yep. And now, uh, guys don't know that, but uh, you're not always, uh, well, you're never welcomed with open arms like, wow, you know, you know, you walk in, it's a very intimidating experience checking into your first SEAL team. Uh, you're a new guy, and guys think at times you get through buds and all that stuff, and that the whole team flocks out to, you know, embrace you like you're one of us now. It ain't quite that way. <laughs> so, uh, especially when you're an ensign, you've got nothing on your chest but, you know, three little ribbons that the Navy gave you, and, uh, you know, no trident yet, and uh, you're wearing your summer whites. <laughs> so, We're doing the O course today. Let's go, you know. Yeah, that, you know, nobody, nobody wears summer whites and, at the SEAL team. So, you know, everybody's wearing camis or PT gear. Yeah, and, see. Uh, you know, so we, we stuck out like sore thumbs. And it's a tough nut to crack there uh, when you go, because uh, you know you got to prove yourself. You proved yourself in buds, and then you get to a team, and you know you you did it there in buds. But uh, you know SDVs are particularly uh, difficult being an officer at, and uh, you know dudes are watching everything you do. You get a, a a name in SEAL team real quick by doing something stupid. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, so how was it? What uh, what went on there at your uh, first team? It's uh, Anson Smith now. And, uh, well, I tell you what, I, I enjoyed SDVs to a degree. Now, I will say this. I was pretty burned out after about four years there. Um, we did a couple, couple trips, uh, but, you know, our trips then, you know, they were... You know, they were European vacations.
limitations compared to what they're doing nowadays. I mean, we basically just trained with the French and the Span Spaniards, the Germans, the you know Italians. It was just a lot of bilateral training out in the Med. And if something happened, you know, we were there to respond to it. But you know, we we were there in the in the 90s. And to be honest with you, the 90s just bored the crap out of me. And um, you know, I, I did enjoy the job of being an SDV officer. And uh, I also, you know, worked the DBS side of it as well. So actually learned the whole system that, you know, launched the mini sub from the sub. And so it was fairly technical type uh, of learning, but uh, really good skill to know. And um, uh, it was just a lot of fun. Alden and I, Millsy, we were in the same task unit. We had three platoons that formed as a task unit. That's how they deployed there at SDV and uh, just had a great old time. In fact, the CEO of BUDS now was our boss. He was our task unit commander, Stu Elliott. So uh, he, he's the CEO of BUDS, I hear now. So, Well, I was on the uh, his uh, fateful jump when he uh, bent oh, yeah, his so leg yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. That was not yeah. a good one. Yeah. Uh, he was he was beat up after that one. Oh yeah, that's uh, well. You know, uh, he was like that. You know, he was a uh, that dude was a physical freak. I always uh, remember him talking about you know your body's a weapon, your body's a weapon. <laughs> well, that dude was a uh, scary uh, specimen of a uh, physical stud. Yeah. But uh, boy, did he wreck that leg, man! One bad jump, you know, and it's uh, it's an op over. Yeah, he was a second phase dive officer when I was uh, going through. Mm -hmm. So he, he was hard. He was hard on the students. Yeah. So I do remember him. And that, that's weird because, you know, you go back and next thing you know, these guys that were your buds instructors, they're now, you know, they're either your bosses or they're your chiefs or, you know, it, you, you really start your reputation in SEAL teams going through buds. Yeah. And, you know, the phones start ringing out there, too. It's uh, very strange. I, I even go out of my way to tell guys down here that, you know, when you go through a course, I'm not making any phone calls. I'm not keeping any records. Uh, but you go through buds. And, you know, what's strange, you go through first phase. And as you're getting close, the first phase instructors are telling the second phase instructors who the hell's coming. Uh, who you got to watch, uh, who sucks, who's great, and the second phase tells it to the third phase. Third phase tells it to, you know, the SQT instructors, and the SQT instructors ultimately, uh, you know, make phone calls to your team and say, dude, you know, you got a good one coming here, or, you know, this. Uh, all good, but, uh, that, you know, and that continues on. Now, these guys uh, need to always understand that, uh, you're never done being tested. You're always under the clock and the watch, and uh, you can spend 30 years in SEAL team, and it will never end. You know. Yep, you're right. And it's I that competitive what, it, thing it's, you're it's talking fun, about. It, it's a fun job. Yeah. It's a really fun job. But I tell you what, SDVs though, if you like scuba diving, it's great. But you will be burned out being underwater because you are under the water a lot. Yeah. Um, However, nowadays, the war has changed things a little bit. you got SDV guys that are, you know, also Afghanistan and Iraq and, and doing things with no mini-sub around them. We used to say back at SDVs, are, are you uh, SDV qualified or just a SEAL? <laughs> so, you know, because really, the SDV, all that meant was you were still a SEAL. You just knew how to get into where you needed to be by a mini-sub. So... It was a. Uh, it took some time to learn how to do that. Yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm reading some of the comments here. Uh, Baker Basher, that's that's not a correct number there of dudes that make it through that training. Uh, I would know, you would not know. I'm not really. Okay. Dude. Uh, one of the guys is making a comment on here. You guys got to quit reading that shit off of the internet. You'll get it straight from here. But uh, uh, we're into the teams now, and, you know, when the guys go through sniper school and they go through, uh, you know, a number of other schools, dev group, there's a, uh, there's still an attrition rate there. And guys find that very hard to, uh, to buy into, uh, that there is. And uh, I, even uh, SDV school, uh, things like that. Did you lose anybody through that school? 
Yeah, yeah, there were a couple people that, that didn't do very well in it, and um, but uh, nobody did bad enough where they didn't like not go to the STV team. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Right. Like they basically just worked with them more and more to make sure that they were certified, able to drive this thing. And probably the chances are only the best guys at STVs are going to be the drivers of that STV anyway. I mean, you, you want two or three guys in your in your squad or platoon to be able to drive that thing just in case. But, mm-hmm. you know, usually when you're really doing your, your, your stuff, you're going to have an A team and a B team. That's just the way it is. And you right. always you, you always want to be that A team. Like for, for me, it was, you know, you wanted to be the navigator, you know, with the best pilot. And, um, you know, it was, like I said, it, 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 for me, it was a good job. Like I said, I, I've been scuba diving all my life, but I soon realized after it's doing STVs and doing these European vacation deployments that, um, that I needed a break. And, um, you know, I just got married and, um, you know, I was gone, you know, pretty much, I was gone nine months the year that we were engaged, and then I was gone nine months the year we got married. Um, so, you know, at that point I was like, you know, I think I'm ready for a break, and this job at the Naval Academy opened up. So I actually went back to the Naval Academy for shore duty, um, and I was probably pretty young doing it, being a uh, being a five-year lieutenant, and I could have picked up another SEAL platoon at another team, but my, my whole mission was if I miss the SEAL teams, I'll go back. And, um, you know, times being what they were, you know, it was 97, 98, um, you know, I, I realized I just made a decision. I said, you know, there's other things I want to do. And I actually got out in uh, December of uh, 1998. So, well, that's a very cool thing about the, you know, SEAL team. Uh, you know, guys uh, can uh, get really focused in other directions. It's like, I, I kicked ass here, I've done it, uh, and I'm going to surpass that. And you are uh, certainly one of the guys that has, uh, you know, uh, got out of SEAL team. I Didn't you write a book about the Border Patrol PT test? <laughs> well, you know, what I did after I graduated, or after I uh, got out of, the, uh, out of the military, is I... I knew I wanted to write. I didn't know what I wanted to write about, <clears throat> but I soon found that, hey, you know, I've been training these young guys to be be uh, SEALs uh, from the academy, did a pretty good job. Like everybody that I was training was making it through, and then uh, I said, well, this is a program I used with them, and that one actually became <clears throat> the 12 Weeks to Buds, right. which is my you know complete guide to Navy SEAL fitness book, and that one came out right as I got out of the out of the Navy. And since then, what I decided to do is diversify a little bit and say, well, I'm not only going to write about the Navy SEAL fitness test, but I want to write about every single fitness test that's out there. And so I've hunted for the last decade of uh, all the fitness tests, whether it's a local police department test, Navy test, Army mm-hmm. test, Rangers, SF, you know, Border Patrol, Arm, you know, ATF, Secret Service, whatever it is, everybody has to pass a fitness test to get in. And my market really is those young men and women who want to serve their country, whether it's in the military, special ops, law enforcement, or firefighters. So basically, if if they're looking for a way to get in shape to pass that entrance exam, physical fitness test, I have your answer. And uh, that's that's what I've been doing for the last decade, is uh, just focusing on creating programs for young men and women who want to serve. It's very cool uh, that guys do that when they get out. You know, you you figure out, you know, uh, you know, the only thing that sucks about SEAL Team is that you don't know what you're capable of. And guys would ask you, you know, I'll bear, uh, uh, how far can you swim? How far can you run? And, you know, the typical SEAL, an- uh, the only SEAL answer is, I don't know, I never ran that far. You know, you don't know how far you can go. I've never gone that far. And when guys get out of it, you know, it, it's just that mindset keeps going. And uh, every time I'm on your website, I'm like, holy shit, he's, you know, he's gone another one, you know, done this, done that. You know, very cool what you're doing. And, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, 
You know, you're a badass. Thanks. It's, 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 uh, like I said, it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. I will tell you this, though. I would say about 60% of my emails I get, and I probably get about about 200 a day now, um, about 60% of them, more than 100, are kids who are overweight and out of shape and want to, I mean, don't even meet the minimum standard to get into the military. Mm-hmm. So one thing I've had to do is really kind of backtrack a little bit and say, well, you know, I don't want to give you a Navy SEAL workout right now. I'll kill you. You know, so I've started creating different programs, you know, where a young kid who maybe be 30 or 40 pounds overweight can, you know, learn a little bit more about eating properly, you know, hydrating, and slowly get into a fitness program that's not going to kill them. And, you know, they get stronger, they build a foundation, and then we start talking about Navy SEAL style workouts and things like that. But did you know... Whenever you and I joined the military, you know, the number one cause for not getting into the military was usually some kind of criminal record, or you didn't meet the the medical standards because you had, you know, flat feet or a heart murmur or something like that, or poor ASVAB scores. Now, the number one reason why kids don't join the military or can't get into the military is because they don't meet the height, weight standards. Yeah, and I, over, oh, yeah. over fifty thousand people were turned away last year from serving their country because they were overweight. Yeah, and you know what pisses me? You know, I tell these guys, you know, guys get you know contact me, uh, you know, all about their workout and their training and everything, and they're uh, into these really crazy uh, types of you know things and fitness. You know, they're young rubber dudes. That's what I call them. You're a young rubber guy, man. You can whoop your ass. Uh, you just got to put your uh, nose to it, man, and uh, get it done. But the guys go into these, well, I'm going to train for two years before. You know, what the fuck's your problem, homeboy? You know, uh, young dude, get it done. Get out there and kick some ass. And uh, yeah. uh, it can be, man. Yeah, that, 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 that body that you have from 18, 19, 20 years old is, is something that uh, you will never have again. That's right. Uh, I'm 42. We're 42 this year, and uh, you know I am constantly still working out with 20-year-olds. But you know my end of the week, you know my wife, I tell you, I'm hobbling around the damn house like uh, like a truck hit me because I just can't recover like I used to when I was 20 years old. So I'm on the constant search for recovery exercises, and I found a lot of them. And uh, you know, so I'm still hanging hanging in there, but. Um, you know, I, I have to suck it up a little more uh, mm-hmm. by Thursday, Friday than the average twenty-year-old. I'm glad you said that uh, too about these younger guys. You know, a younger guy. You know, I know I did it, and and you certainly did it. You know, the uh, you uh, have it all when you're uh, that young, right up in your, you know, very early twenties. You know, you recover quick and. Uh, you recover from injury quick. You recover from illness quick, man. You are just, uh, you know, ready to go get it on, and uh, you can. I, you know, unfortunately, I see some of these guys. You know, they call, they ask him questions about buds, and uh, you know, I ask them, uh, "How far did you run today?" Well, uh, I, well, I didn't run today. Well, how far did you run yesterday? Well, I, I didn't run. You know, ah, oh, come on, man. You know, get off, dude. You know, you got to, you know, an hour in the gym and a two-mile run ain't cutting it to get ready to buds. No, absolutely not. You know, and some of these workouts these days, you know, they're 30, 45 minutes in the gym and they're done. You know, I said, you, you, know, you got to figure buds on average is a 12-hour day. You know, now you're not active that whole 12 hours, but you, you bet you that there's about a good eight hours that you're doing something physical every day. You know, and and that's just an average day. You know, you're running the chow, you're running back, you're paddling in your boats, you're doing PT, you're doing an obstacle course, you're doing a swim. You know, those things add up, and uh, you're not going to prepare for it unless you're doing those type of things. Well, let's go. Now, you're, uh, you're a rock star. You had a rock star background. You uh, rock started through Buds and Seal Team, but uh, uh, your rock star book 12 weeks to buds i hear a lot about it you know really good stuff tell guys to get that uh what brought all that up 
How did you devise the 12 Weeks to Buds? Well, I when I wrote that program, it used to be 12 pages. And it started off as just 12 pages that were 12 one-week workouts that every midshipman had um, at the Naval Academy. And I said, here's what we're going to do for the next 12 weeks. And uh, so they had it. If they couldn't make a PT, they were doing it. So I created that program um, with the midshipmen. And uh, those guys, uh, we turned a, a lot of midshipmen I mean, into really hard dudes. I mean, they're hard anyway, but these guys came back super hard. And, you know, every class that I had, I had a, I had an honor man that was, uh, that was part of, uh, you know, the class. Uh, I had no quitters. Um, and so, you know, I just looked at this program and I said, damn, this is pretty good. It's working really well. There's nothing really out there like it. I'm going to write a damn book. And, um, you know, so, you know, another six months later, um, you know, I had this book done and, um, you know, I, I, I found out what I wanted to do after that. So when a guy uh, picks up that book, uh, 12 Weeks to Buds, and I know a lot of guys, a lot of guys down here talking about that book, uh, who starts out with that book? Uh, are you, ta what kind of guy? Uh, That's a good question. I, I have in there now, after it's, it's been revised three times, I've updated it because, you know, programs change, entrance things change, a seal challenge, used to be the die fair program, mm -hmm. you know, so, so I've updated all that stuff, but I've pretty much kept the workout exactly the same. And this workout is really, here, here in hindsight, I look at it this way. If you're a football playing power lifter type of, uh, type of athlete, right? So you got a lot of fast twitch muscle fibers, your speed and power. This is a good workout book for you to turn yourself into an endurance athlete, muscle stamina stud. It'll really do that for you. Now, if you're already an endurance athlete, you probably need some type one muscle fibers um, that are type, type two muscle fibers that are going to um, be a little more explosive, a um, little more speed, a little more strength, you know, to do log PT and those type of things. Um, so you can do this workout and maintain all of your endurance and muscle stamina, but you may need to add some weights into that thing. So, you know, in hindsight, I look at it as, you know, it doesn't have any weights in it. And, and that's part of the beauty of it. A lot of people like that because, because it's so simple. Yep. Uh, you don't need any equipment. Um, but then there's, it. I don't think it's for everybody. And that, that's my one caveat I say. I don't think it's for everybody because if you're a skinny guy that needs to gain weight and put on some muscle mass, um, you probably need to probably need to do some weight lifting with it. So, do you have uh, some other books out there for that guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've pretty much covered them with, uh, we've got a Maximum Fitness it's like a Navy SEAL cross training book that's out there. Um, has a weightlifting cycle in it. That's pretty good. It's more like more hypertrophy type muscle. So you're just trying to build muscle mass. Mm -hmm. um, it, way, it was a 52 week cycle in this thing. And what we did, uh, this is what we did at the SEAL team because during the winters, we would try to put on 10 or 15 pounds of muscle little bit of bulk because we would freeze our ass off during those winter dives uh, <laughs> doing the STV stuff. So I remember, I remember, before I ever forget, you know, putting STV in the water and, you know, ice is breaking. Yeah, you're breaking you know, the ice. When you're doing it, there's nothing much worse than that. Let yeah. me tell you, that's damn cold. And um, uh, you want to put on a bunch of muscle mass. So it's a cycle in this 52 week plan that takes you from like PT cycle, you, you know, you PT, you, you get all super lean in the summer and the spring, and then you come back down, you taper back down with less high reps and more weight stuff in the winter, just to build up the weight. And you just kind of go through this cycle. So it's just, it's just a periodization program that mixes in lifting with your high rep calisthenics. So you're still an endurance guy, but you're also picking up some weight. You drop the endurance a little bit and pick up some, some weightlifting in there. So. Yeah, you uh, change it up depending on what your uh, 
doing, you know, the Arctic uh, warfare, the SDV, gaining weight, you know, into the, uh, uh, you know, some of the other training that goes on in SEAL team, the guys are, uh, you know, guys just do different things for uh, different things that they're going to do uh, there. And, uh, oh, yeah, cool. I mean, that's the cool thing about SEAL team. Once you get to the SEAL team, I mean, there's guys doing Ironmans, there's guys doing powerlifting competitions, you know, every now and then you get a bodybuilder, you know, it, you know, it happens. Um, you know, you find, you find the love and you do it. And as long as it's not interfering with your job, they'll keep, they'll let you keep doing it. All right. Yeah. Did you ever know, uh, Mikey Ballister? Yes. <laughs> that dude yeah. was probably the fattest seal in seal team. But when he would hit that pull up, he was a freaking power lifter. That was the strongest seal I ever saw in my life. But he just looked like that, uh, you know, put that guy on the pull-up bars, and it was a freak show. So there's just, you know, everybody, you know, uh, he wasn't the fastest runner in the team, so, but boy, oh, boy, I'd have hated for that dude to ever get mad at me, man. You know? <laughs> and uh, guys just, uh, you know, go, uh, yeah, just, it, it's all different uh, all the way around. Yep, and that's why I like this. I wrote this article about, the diversity in the teams and it's true I mean everybody there's something for everybody you know the small guy is has advantages in ways that the big guy doesn't have you know um, he's going to have weaknesses that the big guy doesn't have and vice versa um, you know the big guy the skinny guy the guy that's uh, um, you know, a tall guy a short guy you name it um you know, there, there's all types of body types in SEAL teams, and, um, you know, we need the diversity. Well, you see that a lot as the, uh, you know, as a uh, SEAL officer that leads these, and I tell these guys down here, you know, and it should make sense to them that in every SEAL platoon, uh, there's a faster SEAL that runs, and there's a slower SEAL. Uh, yep. There's a faster swimmer, a slower swimmer, a better shot down to the worst shot, and even our worst is most people's best. But you know, then you know uh, the way a SEAL team operates, you put those guys in a position of strength. You yep. know, so uh, your faster uh, runner might not be your best shot, but you know, guess who's going through the door and. Uh, you know, just uh, different things that we do. It's the same thing. Uh, yeah, every day I remember life. at our team we had um, actually in our in our task unit. You know, we had some guys that you know weren't good runners at all. Looked a little bit overweight. If you looked at them, yeah, you couldn't tell they were. You know, they didn't look like they were. You know, super specimens. Um, but uh, you know, he put on a pair of fins and kicks everybody's ass in the swim. Mm -hmm. You know, he uh, he's a type of guy that I remember. Um, you know, you'd look at him and you didn't really think he had much to offer to the SEAL team, yeah. but whenever you take that bus down to do that ocean swim down mm -hmm. there uh, in Virginia Beach, right, and the guy who drove the bus lost the keys, right? But this guy says, oh, don't worry about it. You know, hot wires the damn bus and we're back, you know, we're back on the road again. Yeah, you that know? is so a... Everybody has a skill. Everybody has some skill that it, either they learned through SEAL teams or they learned in life and they bring to the SEAL teams, and it is invaluable. You know, what I liked the most were the guys that would come to me, or I'd go to them and I'd say, hey, we need to get this, this, and this, and uh, they would get it, sure enough, before lunch, and I'd say, damn, where'd you guys get that? Don't ask, sir. <laughs> no, that's right. Don't ask. <laughs> okay. You don't want to know. <laughs> I said, all right, thank you. Uh, and and very cool talking to you and Alden. And I'll I'll say this say uh, away uh, because I, I was on Alden. Uh, Alden was just a really really big guy when he showed up the SEAL team. Uh, and his perfect push ups. I got all this stuff here he sent. Uh, but Alden was never just this chiseled dude. You know this just this uh, six pack ab and the, the guys that would be posing for underwear commercials. Uh, but just a super strong guy and a super strong mindset, and uh, you're a really big guy. But you're, you know, the underwear commercials. You're just a big guy that's got that mindset, really strong dude, and uh, just blows guys away. But does that make any sense? Yeah, you know, um, I, I look at it this way: there's two types of fitness out there. There is performance fitness, and there's aesthetic fitness. And either you are working out to look good or you're looking you're working out to be good. 
And um, I tell people all the time, I said, if you're doing a bodybuilder workout to try to prepare for buds, you're going about it the wrong way. You know, a bodybuilder workout is like isolating exercises of your biceps. You know, you're doing leg curls. You're doing, you know, preacher curls. You know, shit like that that's not really going to help you. Mm -hmm. um, that's aesthetic fitness. You're, all you're doing is building a beach body, right? Uh, you need to do full movement exercises. You need to do lots of PT, lots of running, lots of swimming. And it's all about performance. Don't worry how big your bicep is. It's uh, and Bud's is a big handle your body weight. You know, I was telling the guys uh, uh, on here. You know, the the instructors used to uh, fuck with me all the time. They'd go, "Shit, your gut sticks out further than your chest does." But uh, <laughs> dude, man, I could. Oh boy, I was I could run. And I think a lot of that comes down to mindset. And uh, I'll let you answer that. But then I'm going to hit you uh, after that with this uh, mindset stuff. Is a lot of that is just mindset. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Like I said, I, I talked about it earlier about you go to Bud's to compete, not just survive. And, uh, you know, if you're trying to survive at Bud's and, you know, you got 29 minutes to do a four mile time run or you fail, right? That, that's a big pressure. I mean, not only like, you know, the day before that run, but an hour before that run, half an hour before that run. I mean, you're sweating in your pants. I, I remember I used to watch these guys really get nervous for this four mile time run, and I'd just say, hey man, what's wrong? Oh man, I gotta pass this thing. Oh, <laughs> that's a like, bad oh, place man. to be, man. <laughs> I mean, like, you got, all right, but, uh, you know, you should have thought about that a year ago. You know, I never went to Bud. You know, I wasn't any. You know, I'm, I'm telling the guys are writing comments up here. You know, I was a pretty studly dude, man. But I was never ripped. But I could just handle, and uh, that's what Bud's is, as far as I'm concerned, is handling your body weight. And I don't care if you're a buck thirty or you're two thirty. You know, like Alden, that you're able to handle that body weight to do what they do in Bud's. Yep. And you know, the mindset thing comes into it. Uh, so now I got to hit you up about this uh, this water stuff, the ice bath. Uh, oh. <laughs> all these guys remember you taking that ice bath, and I remember calling you the next day after that show aired uh, because it made so much sense to me what went on. Uh, but uh, tell us how all that came about. Well, these guys called me up and they said, "Hey, we're looking for a seal to do uh, either a hypothermic test or a hyperthermic test." You know, like the Israeli did that uh, that heat one right after me. Yeah. And um, I said, well, hell, I don't want to be hot. You know, that's for damn sure, because uh, I've been cold more than I've been hot. I've probably been, so if you go SDVs, you're going to be hypothermic probably three or four times while you're there. I mean, you just, 12-hour dive, you're going to get damn cold, and your body temperature is going to drop in the hypothermic range. And it just does, and you know how to deal with it. And not to get warm again and it, it's not that big a deal so I was like yeah I could probably handle that one a lot better I wasn't looking forward to it uh, especially getting out and having to run an obstacle course and shoot even though the obstacle course was really kind of a joke but um, you know the shooting at the end I was wondering if my hands were going to work but uh, the way I was situated in that thing it worked out pretty well however you know, I get a lot of comments like, hey, you weren't even in there deep. You know, you're only like to your nipples. But, you know, I was in that thing for over an hour. That's your core, and, man. And, and, they, and they showed that thing. They showed that thing for about as a 20 minute segment. But there were, it was a good 30 minutes that they didn't show on that TV that's just sitting on the cutting room floor of me into that thing up to my neck. And uh, my only thing that's really sticking out is my hands, and I'm freezing my ass off. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that was, uh, I could have done much worse. I was very pleased with how I performed, not only in that tank, but when I got out and shot the guy. Um, uh, that, that, that was a lot of fun. It was a good challenge. Uh, the first time, the first few times I did it before I was, I was cold, you know, it was, you know, it was just kind of fun and games, and I really wasn't that focused. And I was hitting center body mass shots, you know, whenever I would hit the guy, um, you know, for the first few uh, takes that they, they did it before I got cold. But uh, once I got cold, man, I realized it was game on because uh, I, 
didn't think my legs would jump me high enough to get over that damn wall or balance very well. And uh, I remember being really focused after that and uh, had to really put on my A game to uh, get across that obstacle course, which made it a lot more fun for me, and I think I tried harder. So, you know, when I saw the guy's head stick up, I just, you know, popped him right between the eyes there, which was, uh, that, that was fun. Stu, I, I think uh, 999 people out of 1,000 that saw that would have just been extremely impressed. You know, uh, doing the seal, doing all the stuff I did, extremely impressed. You know, uh, the occasional critic out there that's sitting, you know, with a bag of fucking Doritos on his couch, you know, fucking talking shit. But, you know, when I called you the next day, it made a lot of sense to me for some reason because... Uh, I don't know the uh, you know being a seal for so long you know even an actual mammal seal a seal uh, you know in really cold water they start shutting down the uh, blood flow to their extremities that's how they're built I know all about the mammalian diving reflex I mean we learn a lot about that but the, your core temperature went up and I had never really thought about that and when I talked to you the next day I thought is there a percentage of guys in this world that can do that? And they're the ones that can, you know, by and large, uh, you know, become SEALs. Can a lot of the guys that quit in Hell Week, uh, they're guys that are not able to do that. Their core temperature drops. You know, it was kind of amazing. Uh, it was amazing watching it, and you baffled those scientists. So what I'm, I'm wondering is, do you think that uh, there is just a certain group of guys uh, that can control that, uh, and a lot of dudes that cannot. Well, you know, I talked to a couple of physiologists on that very topic after this, this was done, and a lot of them said, yeah, sure, it could be some genetics, but by and large, it is your training. It is your adaptation to what you have been through in your life is what has enabled, enabled you to do that. Because every Eskimo up in Alaska could probably do the same thing, right? Um, you know, they live in the cold. Their body's used to the cold. It's just what how their body has adapted to that environment. And, um, you know, like I said, I was cold many, many times um, before, you know, scuba dive since I was 12 years old. So I always felt comfortable underwater, you know, being in cold water. Uh, so, you know, maybe maybe I created some adaptation to it. But, you know, maybe there is some genetic thing to it that if they could test, you know, you might have a good idea whether or not this guy or could or could not make it through buds. But at the end, the physiologist said, nope, it's all your adaptation, hmm. right? If you lived in the desert, you wouldn't be able to do that. You know. I don't know. I'd like to have seen that done again with uh, just perhaps, you know, well, a hundred guys and, and see what had happened uh, to them. And I, I know I know where you're going with that. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I was the hot, cold dude, you know, so much extreme desert, so much extreme Arctic. You know, the uh, Eskimos have smaller noses. Uh, so they, you know, can warm the air going in their lungs versus, uh, you know, the African continents with the broader noses. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of that over there in the uh, Arctic, they have hair on their ass from sitting on ice flows. It's genetically built into them. A lot of weird adaptations. But from a guy coming from Florida, I would, uh, I would wonder if SEAL Team was enough to do it because uh, I really don't see how you could raise your body temperature. Yeah, well, you know what they um, what they showed in there because those guys uh, from Stanford do this test all the time, evidently, and they created this device that heats you up, and uh, which was pretty cool. That I wish they would have shown how they warmed me back up, but it, that once again that was on the cutting room floor as well. But those those physiologists that we're talking about, they they set my little chart up to one of their normal test charts, and. You know, for the first five minutes, everybody's heart, you know, you know, temperatures is up in the 90s, you know, 98, 99. But then they had the, the other guy, which was the average guy, if you want to call it that, started dropping off really quick, whereas mine stayed up there for a good 45 minutes after, you know, the other guys went down. So I think it was an ability to... 
to um, maintain a lot of heat, which really is just a, a function of, um, you know, your body's ability to produce energy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's all, you know, to keep you warm. And uh, one thing that I learned at Bud's was if you're going to get cold, you need to go eat your ass off. And so while, while they were getting ready for this event, I went outside to the little chow wagon that they have out there, at, you know, <laughs> these Hollywood sets, and uh, I probably ate about four steaks with all the fat on it and uh, ate a big bowl of peanuts, uh, a couple pieces of chicken, even we put the skin on it too, and I was just, I had a furnace full of food that was just creating energy. And I know that was a big part of me being able to stay in that water, is just having plenty of food in my belly. Yeah, being smart about it, but uh, uh, no, never take anything away from you there. Uh, very impressive, and uh, because you and I have certainly been in the surf zone, to uh, you know, in buds and seen, oh man, dudes just run from that cold water so fast. And then you know, I'm sure you were a really popular guy in Hell Week. I know I was. Everybody flocked to me when we went in there, you know, let's get some uh, shipless body heat, you know, I just project it like a furnace, you know, yep. so uh, I think it's uh, a little bit more than that, I think you're uh, uh, a weird dude and just a cut above uh, genetics wise to, uh, to be able to do that, I don't, I don't know Stu about the whole steak things, and get something different going on there and good for hey, you baby. man, you're a badass. You know, my dad, my dad thinks so, my dad thinks it's genetics. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we see that, you know. Uh, he, 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 he takes credit for it. How some uh, father and sons get through uh, buds. You know, it's uh, you would think that every SEAL uh, son would be able to make it through buds training. And they yeah. don't. Most of them do not. Uh, they don't even come close. And I think it uh, is a little bit of mixing the genes with a mother who doesn't quite have that, but where you see it even more is SEAL brothers. We got a lot of SEAL brothers yeah, in the teams. Right. You get that mother-father genetic thing going, and uh, you know, one of my uh, instructors coming down here, you know, his brother's in, and there was a lot of brothers, you know, the twins and all kinds of stuff, uh, much more brothers in the teams than there ever was father and son, so. I don't know, dude. I think you got a good gene pool there, and uh, you're kicking ass. Could be. I got a little man. He's uh, seven years old right now. He's, um, you know, he, we'll see what happens. He's an early riser like me, so let's see if uh, he'll uh, do, do the seal thing one day. <laughs> there you go. Now, uh, we've got all uh, the, jeez, uh, I think we about covered it all, Stu. What, uh, what would you tell these guys? Now, you... Uh, you know, steer this. Now, I will tell guys, and I've already told guys, I don't know how many times I've talked to that, that, uh, you know, that PT I did with you a couple of years ago, uh, honestly, was the best PT I'd ever done in the SEAL team. And I had been doing that shit for years and years and years and years. Uh, but a very thorough, for some reason, it just wasn't a, you know, SEAL PTs are typically a grind session for some reason. You know, the guy on Wednesday is trying to outdo the beating you took on Tuesday. Uh, but you had a very, you know, it was a uh, pleasant, it was uh, well thought out. You kind of went head to toe and then you went back again. So a little bit of chest and into the abs and back to the chest. Can you hit that some? Yeah, you know what? Um, when I'm making workouts, I like to think about perfect balance. So if I'm working the front side of my body, I also want to work the back side of my body. Uh, meaning like if I'm working my chest and shoulders doing push-ups or bench press, I also want to be doing, you know, some upper back, uh, rear deltoid uh, trap exercises. Uh, and they're easy. You can do them with calisthenics or you can do them with weights like reverse flies or what I call um, reverse push-ups, you know, just lifting your hands off the ground, flexing your upper back. Um, great for the posture, you know, prevents uh, internal rotation of your shoulders, which creates a lot of problems for a lot of soldiers, especially, you know, carrying a backpack and, you know, that just internally rotates you, you know, and messes up the alignment of your spine. It can just, there's so many things that can go wrong when you have an imbalanced workout. And, uh, you know, usually a push pull.
pull routine usually works out pretty well. So if you're doing a lot of push exercises, you know, balance it out with a lot of pull exercises, meaning, you know, if you're pushing, you're going to be using chest, tri, shoulders. You know, pull, you're going to use your back, your biceps, you know, which are all the opposing muscle groups for, uh, for the push uh, exercises. And, of course, you want to do the same thing with the legs. You know, if you're working the thighs, you got to work the hamstrings. And I don't mean by isolating them. You don't have to do, like, leg curls and leg extensions, but, you know, squats and lunges and, you know, even deadlifts and power cleans. You know, all those things are great exercises. Swimming with fins is probably one of the best exercises. Yeah. Works the front of your hips and works the back of your hips. You know, it balances you out really well. Um, you know, which can help you with running and, you know, get, get your stride better for running as well. Um, but I, I would say if the, the most important thing is balance because you, if you go into to SEAL training and you're fairly imbalanced, meaning you have stronger chest muscles than you do back muscles or rear delt muscles, chances are you're probably going to hurt your shoulder um, in SEALs. You know, if your thighs are stronger than your hands, you're probably going to hurt your knee. Um, you know, if your lower back's jacked up because you just haven't really worked your lower back, but you've worked your abs with hundreds and hundreds of crunches and sit-ups, um, you know, you're probably going to hurt your lower back. So balance is the key to not only SEAL training, but also longevity in life, period. Yeah. So. Well, you know, have you sustained any other uh, injuries? Now you're getting to be an older guy. I hate to lump you in that category, but... Uh... Uh, you know, after SEAL team, now that you're getting older, I know you just still crank it out every day with these young guys and blow them away. But uh, hey, how's you your know, injuries been? We do pretty well here. Um, I got a pretty good routine. Um, I do a routine I call the solstice training cycle. And pretty much the way it works is this. is uh, We are on our way up. If the day is long, our workouts are long. So... You know, the days are getting longer right now, you know, starting March 21st, I think, uh, right. or actually, uh, that's the solstice. So, um, starting in uh, December, we start ramping up our workouts, making them just a little harder than the day before. And by June, July, we are peaked out. We are about as, you know, these are two and a half, three hour workouts. But right now, you know, back in January, we're just doing an hour, hour and a half workouts. So we're on our way up to peaking, and basically if you take 12 months of the year, we do a big bell curve of the year. So the middle of the months are very intense. The first few are kind of easy, and the last few are kind of easy. So you just kind of go through this continual cycle of um, you know ramping up, maxing out, cooling back down, and you just go through this cycle. And it really has helped me you know, in the last 10 years, 15 years, stay injury-free other than some minor hiccups. You know, I get some fasciitis on my feet sometimes. Um, plantar fasciitis, I uh, had that once, uh, but it didn't stop me from running. Uh, so it wasn't, I didn't consider it injury, it just hurt. Um, I haven't had any knee problems. Uh, lower back gets a little stiff a lot, but, you know, uh, nothing too bad. But uh, yeah, I'm doing okay. Doing okay. So what? Uh, what is Stu Smith going to do for PT tomorrow, man? Tomorrow I have, and here's something that might interest some of you guys. If you're in the Maryland area, I do free workouts. Right? I donate about 500 hours a year to this workout group, and we do it five to six days a week. And we probably see about 2,000. Probably, I think last year we saw about 2,500 kids come through this training program. Um, and they don't pay a dime, and they just show up. If they show up, that's great. If they don't, I don't call you and say where you've been. You know, it's just come on over. But you, you need to call me and let me know if you're coming or email me. And um, But basically, tomorrow we are going to start at 1 o'clock. We do a little run mixed with some PT. I have some pull-up bars on this running path every mile so we'll probably run like uh i don't know four miles every mile in between we got some pull-up bars to uh, stop do some pull-ups come back and then at two o'clock we start swimming and uh killer swim pt workout oh my battery's going low here got this killer swim pt workout and uh, basically we do pull-ups and dips along the pool deck and uh you know probably swim about a mile worth of swimming by three o'clock we're done and uh, like I said, we're just ramping it up into the 
next phase right now. Yeah. I know I've screwed your phone up, man. You've been uh, kicking ass here tonight. Uh, really good job. I got one more question for you. Okay. I'm showing up a uh, showing a picture of your buds class. Yeah. And uh, I remember uh, busting a phony uh, that was claiming to uh, be next to you in this picture. Yeah, I remember that. And I told you, no, that's not him. That's a kid named Miller. Oh God, Maybe those clowns! Oh, those clowns! Uh, what's the chance of you sending down a, uh, some of those 12 weeks to Buds? I give one to the honor graduates down here, one to, the, one to the most improved, and have one laying around the cabin. I tell you what, you email me and uh, give me your address, and I'll ship you about five of them down there for you. Let me know how many you need. Perfect. Stu, uh, last-minute motivation for these guys, man. What's the key to getting through Buds, dude? Uh, I've said it a few times already. key is to got to have that mindset of competing, not just surviving. That will do the trick. Sounds good, man. A lot of mileage. Uh, really, really good job, bro. And uh, hell, dude, you marathoned it tonight. Yeah, we, yeah that was a big one. Yeah, we my covered it from... Uh, die, so if I just happen to hang up, it's because my phone died. I can't find my charger. Well, these guys got to be impressed that uh, we, you and I have not had to get up and take a piss yet because we're uh, we're gutting it out here. You know, we just do things like this. You know, we. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I pissed in my cup, so I was uh, I was sitting in my office peeing in my cup. So I've already well, done there that. There you go. Uh, you get it. <laughs> Nothing and not anything worse outside. You know, when you were talking about that freezing cold water, I was thinking of how many times they shoved that thermometer up my rear end and I dove with it, you know, just to see how cold I was. Oh, some of the things they used to do to us, you know. Testing that body temperature, but they've never been able to figure out what kind of dude can get through buds, man. It's just something that... Uh, yeah, know. they did that same thing to us, too. And uh, they, they came back and said, we don't know how you're doing it. No. <laughs> Can't figure it out. When most guys yeah. couldn't, they'd read that thing. And the the, the one we had doing it, uh, she was one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. And uh, she was a doctor, and, you know, we'd come out of the water, it got snot all over your face, you'd been diving for hours, you're freezing your ass off. She'd connect to this thing that, you know, you'd stuck up your wazoo, and she'd go, boy, are you cold. No shit, lady, you know. <laughs> you know, how do you guys do it? You know, it's like, oh, this is so embarrassing. You know I got something shoved up my ass here. You know, leave me alone. You know, let me get this thing out and go home. But, uh, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't fun. Oh, that's God. A one, that's a one-way road for me. No, oh, dude. Yeah, that's supposed to go up that thing. Yeah. Hey, uh, really good job, Stu. Uh, a lot of good information. Stu Smith, 12 Weeks to Buds. And uh, 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 all your books, dude, is that the one you recommend the uh, most to these guys going out there? You know, it really depends. You know, like I said, uh, it depends on what kind of athlete they are, uh, what kind of background they've had. But, you know, you know nine times out of ten, that, that book will do. You know, it, it's definitely a 12-week plan that you may want to even do twice. You know, take six months and, and do the whole thing twice. Uh, you, you'll see killer PT scores. I promise you that. There you go. Um, and uh, you know, put you in that high-ranking uh, PT zone where you know they've actually done studies that if you hit the minimum standards on that SEAL PST, you have a six percent chance of graduating buds. Yeah. Which makes no sense why they have the minimum standards so damn low. But if you hit some of those recommended standards, like uh, you know, like nine-minute swim, nine-minute run. You know, 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, 20 pull-ups. You have an 85% chance of graduating buds with those scores. You know, like the, like that magic 15%, no one really knows what it is. Right. But, uh, you know, 85% chance of graduating if you can hit those scores. So. There you go, man. Guys, uh, you know, and a lot of that comes into uh, mindset, you know. She's, you know, first day of buds when everybody looks around the room, you know, who's going to be here in six months and who won't. And uh, it's the guy that, uh, I don't know, oftentimes you don't stay. And, you know, we got into that with the Mikey Ballisters and, uh, you know, Alden and, uh, you know, just guys have just something in them that uh, uh, causes them to perform better, you know, instead of these really cut up, just freaking, I don't know, man. 
Yeah. And Bud's a strange place, man, but uh, what a hell of a lot of fun, you know, to get it done. It is, it is a lot of fun. You will definitely learn what your weakness is, and uh, you'll have to suck up that weakness when you're at Bud's. I mean, and that's one of those things. That everybody has to suck up weakness. I remember every time we do a run, that'd be the thing that I'd have to focus on. You know, I would have to really focus on doing well. You know, I, I was never gooned. I was never in the goon squad, but I had to really focus to not be in the goon squad. Yeah. It, you, you know what I'm talking about? It was just mm -hmm. one of those things that, you know, it, I had to suck it up just a little bit to uh, to be in the, you know, top part of the class. Everything else I felt pretty good at. You know, I could do, and it was fun. It was fun, you know, swimming. It was fun PTing people, you know, you know, do, doing more pull-ups than people and, you know, beating people on the O course. But, you know, whenever it came to that, you know, four-mile time run and long beach runs, it was one of those things that you just had to, get to find and everybody's going to have a weakness some people is going to be swimming with fans some people is going to be that oak course some people is going to be pt on the grinder just depends on who you are so if you got a weakness and you think you know what it is now that's the time to work it yeah i tell these guys you know there's a couple of times in your buds time out there you know with your class that you stand out and i don't even remember what the hell i had done but it was in first phase to do it and uh, one of the instructors gave me a stick Stuart was a freaking stick and uh, told me uh, the next surf passage when your boat comes in you don't paddle I want you in the bow of the boat holding security uh, dude I thought I was king shit at Turdville bro I had a stick and I didn't have to paddle you know so uh, very cool being out of Buds you know guys, unfortunately these guys hear so much bad shit about Buds and it is. There's a lot of it, but uh, some of those, just those moments, man, just those well, moments. I'd tell you one of the best moments at Bud's was we had a full day of training going on. It was like, you know, we had a couple of uh, runs to do, PT, had no course, I think. You know, it was one of those days, and there was a storm that kicked up, and the instructor said, scrap everything, grab the IBSs, we're doing surf passage the rest of the day. And we just had the best time. Yeah. I mean, we got our butts kicked in these eight, ten-foot waves, but it was so much fun, you know, trying to get out there. And when you got out there, then you caught these waves, and you actually just hopped all the way across the beach. You were going so fast. I mean, it was I – mean, those are fun days. It's a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun, too. Yeah. StuSmith.com. What a badass. Let's get you back down here, bro. Yeah, I'd love to, man. Let me know when you got the next thing going on. I'll be a guest instructor or something. Spring is right around the corner, man. We'll kick some ass. All right, sounds good. All right, badass. Thanks a lot, bro. Really, Thank really you. good job. Thank you. Good job. Hey, man, I love your videos, by the way. Oh, hell. I'm burning up these phony seals. Half of this is, you know, training these guys to go. The other half is burning up these phonies. Uh, love it. Close love it. Things. Take it easy, bro. Good job. All right. I'll see you. Bye. Stu, the badass, you know, yeah, he uh, really does a good job, uh, really uh, thinks a lot about the PT, he's just a strong guy, uh, puts a lot of work, puts a lot of effort into it, and he's got the books out the wazoo out there, and, and good ones, you know, whatever he does, uh, writes, researches, you know, he puts it out, yeah, he puts that seal name on it, and uh, kicks some ass.